Hey guys, welcome back. This is International Master Asaf Givon here. Today we're going to be discussing some um, opening theory. This time I'm going to be recommending the so-called accelerated Banco Gambit for Black. So this is uh, a weapon that again can implement against the first move uh, pawn to d4 by white. So for those of you who are familiar or not familiar with the Banco Gambit after the move knight f6, c4, c5, d5, b5, this is the starting point of this gambit. Actually in, um, in Russian culture in the Soviet Union this gambit was referred to as the Volga Gambit. Uh, after the very big river in, uh, in Russia, so uh, if you ask some players from uh, some some Russian grandmaster or, or something about this line, he might refer to it as a Volga gambit. This is the same though. So um, uh, after the move C takes B5, Black White is accepting. Um, White is accepting accepting the gambit, and after the move A6, basically Black is offering one pawn in order to open up uh, lines for his pieces, the B file, the A file on the queen side. Also he's going to be positioning his bishop very nicely on g7. This line is especially popular uh, amongst club players and uh, it's a very aggressive weapon and offers black a lot of opportunities to play for the initiative right from the very first move. Me, I sometimes play this opening uh, in fast time controls game, in Blitz and Rapid mostly. So um, I'm going to be presenting uh, some nice uh, options for Black here to go, as I mentioned, the so-called accelerated Banco Gambit. So by accelerated Gambit, what I essentially mean is to play the Gambit uh, without playing the move uh, D6, as you shall see very soon. So basically play for very, very quick development of the pieces neglecting some um, some moves that white some aggressive moves that white can do in the center of the board so first of all um, uh, let's start uh, at this point um, so in this video I'm, I'm not going to be dealing with any kind of moves from white that are declining the gambit uh, so basically there are some moves such as pawn to b6 or um, some people have tried moves like e3 or other moves but to make this video uh, not too long and heavy i'm only going to be mentioning the move starting from the move b takes a6 which is also the main line and i believe the most important move as the old saying a gambit can be uh, refuted only by accepting it i do want to mention though that if white plays the move uh, pawn to f3, which is uh, the so-called uh, Dlugi line after the Grandmaster uh, Maxim Dlugi, which plays this line very frequently from White's perspective. Uh, the reason I'm mentioning this move specifically is because here uh, Black's strategy of accelerating the development of his king side is working perfectly. So against this move with the idea to play the move pawn to e4 we are not going to even get back the pawn which is possible but our whole idea is to gambit that pawn kind of allow our opponent to take it so white uh, plays f3 black plays g6 immediately pawn to e4 and here most banco players would automatically play the move d6 here with the idea to stop white from advancing in the center further with e5 harassing our knight but in our general strategy and kind of uh, attitude in this uh, video and in this variation we are actually going to be welcoming the move pawn to e5 and we are not going to stop it we are actually going to be kind of provoking white to play this move in order to later on uh, attack his center very quickly so it looks like this bishop to g7 basically just continuing his normal development and as I mentioned basically inviting white to play the move pawn to e5 which looks very tempting since the knight is now forced to go back on g8 but the problem is that white basically made a lot of pawn moves in the opening you see it's already move number seven but he moved probably only pawns by now also his pawn on e5 now is under attack so he must defend it with f4 and now black starts 
kind of uh, in the process of destructing, destroying a uh, white center with the move d6, hitting the pawn on e5, white plays knight f3. This is actually featured in some high level games, including a game by Vladimir Kramnik as white. But uh, black here is actually fairly comfortable. His knight from g8 has no problems getting back into the game from h6, for example. Uh, black can continue attacking the white center in various ways, for example, knight e7. And here I've seen some games of club players which have been extremely tempted by the move pawn to e6, which looks very scary. But in reality, after f takes e6, d takes e6, this pawn on e6, if anything, is going to be falling fairly quickly. For example, knight b6, even knight f8, I think, is fine. Uh, when this pawn is not going to be lasting too long, since white has no development to in order to defend it. So the move e5 is not too dangerous here. So let's say white just continuing continues his development. He plays um, knight e2. The idea is to develop the knight to c3, then develop the bishop to c4, and get ready to castle. In this case, once again, we are not going to be playing d6 at all. We are going to castle, accelerate our kingside development. And after knight c3, we are going to be using our superior development to strike in the center immediately with the move e6. The idea is to open up the center of the board, the e-file, to attack along the e-file, ideally before he gets the chance to castle. If white now takes our pawn on e6, we should be very happy to recapture with our f-pawn, followed by further advancing in the center with d5. This is why white usually plays bishop to c4 here. Continuing his development, getting ready to castle his own king. But this is now our time to shine. We are now striking back with a little tactical idea, which is very nice. Try to remember that idea in mind. A takes b5. Knight takes b5, and here the very flashy move, knight takes d5. Seemingly a peace sacrifice, but if white now takes our knight, there is this detail. The queen on h4 is attacking both pieces, and white is actually going to be very sorry for not castling earlier. So you should probably take with the bishop on d5, after which um, black is going to be very nicely positioned after queen takes d5 hitting our rook knight to c6 this knight later on might also jump to some other nice squares in the center and black is having a great position here his bishop can come to a6 to create even more pressure you can see that white is very badly behind in development so you should be very careful even not to lose quickly so that was a little note about the move pawn to f3. You can see that our idea with accelerating the king side development works pretty well in this case. So let's focus on the move b takes a6. So pay attention to this. We are now not going to be taking this pawn immediately as we can. Our concept says that this pawn is basically not going to go anywhere. This pawn is under attack three times. There is no way to defend it. Uh, enough times so there is no rush capturing it so black is not going to be playing g6 getting ready to fianchero his bishop on g7 white plays the move knight to c3 black plays bishop to g7 once again not at all in any hurry to take the pawn on a6 we're very soon going to see why white's most principled move here is pawn to e4 seizing the chance to grab the center of the board while also getting ready to develop his bishop into the game. We should also consider white other, white's other option. Basically white has only one serious alternative to the plan with e4 which is to go knight f3 and after castles to go and fianchero his own bishop with the move g3. This is basically uh, a very common way for white to develop his pieces in the Benko Gambit if he wants to avoid all kinds of sharp lines. His plan is fairly simple to go bishop g2 and castle short. 
And now, once again, if Black wants to keep his initiative alive, he should act quickly before White manages to get his king castled. So many moves have been tried in this position. I am going to be recommending the move queen to a5, which is a move you're going to see also in some other lines in the Benko. This move is especially effective when white didn't castle yet since it's create the spin and there are lots of ideas to jump with the knight into the center and create strong pressure on the knight on c3. So for example, if white naively plays the move bishop to g2, just continuing his, uh, his development of pieces, uh, why black should be very happy to play knight to e4 and all of a sudden there are three pieces attacking this knight on c3 and white is forced to make some concessions. So really white should be unpinning himself. The most logical way would be bishop to d2. And now actually a fun fact about this position is the maestro himself, Gary Kasparov in this position uh, after d6, bishop g2 decided to take the pawn a6 with his queen and he actually went on to win his game. That was a, a blitz game back in 1994. So it's very difficult to resist playing a move that Gary Kasparov himself played in this position and also won with it. But I don't particularly like to place my queen on a6 at, in these type of positions. It seems to me like that is the proper square for other pieces. So I'm going to be recommending knight takes a6, which is also a theme you're going to be seeing in this video a couple of times. This knight is usually heading towards b4 when he, when he can create extra pressure on the pawn on b7. Sometimes the knight can also go to c7 with the same idea. And our idea is to get this bishop developed probably somewhere along this diagonal. An example reliant could be short castles, queen to b6, hitting the pawn on b2, and after bishop to c1, bishop to d7, for example, uh, black has a very typical compensation for the Benko gambit. On the next moves, he can position his other rook on b8. You can see that black is a pawn down, but he has immense pressure on white's queen side. Also, this bishop is very useful in this sense. This knight on a6 at the moment looks passive, but at any point he can jump right into the game with a move such as knight before. So Blake is a fairly happy camper in this position. So uh, this whole setup with knight f3 and g3 is, uh, is, is definitely possible, but it, it's not going to kind of discourage Black from achieving a good setup and good compensation. So let us focus on why it's most critical move, which is pawn to e4. Once again, also kind of hinting at the option of playing e5. But as we mentioned earlier, our whole concept is actually to very kind of, um, uh, is um, kind of very ambitiously just allowing this pawn to advance to e5, even though it looks dangerous. So basically, Blake just castles here. So first of all, in many cases that he will play such a move, white will play a move such as e5, almost without thinking, because he will assume that you just forgot to play the move d6 here, which is the very, very normal move in such positions. So that's a kind of a good provoking type of move, because now Blake is not even forced to go back uh, to g8, he has perhaps a slightly more central square on e8, once again hitting the pawn on e5. And in this position, after knight f3, this is just uh, one exemplary line, the knight from e8 is going to get back into the game very quickly. For example, the move d6. White can no longer maintain the pressure in the center, so he must capture on d6. After which white can play, uh, black can play knight takes d6. You see that the, the knight is very much alive and kicking, also not blocking the diagonal for this bishop. And after bishop a2, knight takes a6, once again reoccurring theme, the knight is heading towards one of these two squares. 
This position was featured in some some Grandmaster games. Black had very good results in these positions, I must say, even though objectively the position is fairly even. And uh, one plan for Black could be the move bishop to b7, with the idea to exert pressure on d5 through the moves such as knight b4, perhaps then moving the knight out of d6, maybe to f5 and towards d4. Black has a very nice and active position. So basically the move e5 looks dangerous, but in reality because white is so much underdeveloped, he cannot maintain such aggressive movements in the center without a kind of um, paying a very big price for it. He's basically not ready for such aggressive movements. He should be thinking about his development. So most games from this position have been continued knight of free. Very sensible move. And now, instead of the normal Banco type of moves, d6 or capturing this pawn on a6, by the way, pay attention that this pawn is still there, we still didn't capture it. We are going to be now playing this little surprising move, queen to a5. If you, if you remember a couple of uh, minutes ago, I was telling you that this move, queen a5, you are going to see it more than once. Here, the idea to exert pressure in the diagonal creating the pin on c3 is even more apparent. There is an immediate threat to take this pawn on e4. And the reason that this variation is was kind of originally brought to the main attention of public was the fact that in one rapid game, uh, Magnus Carlsen played it as black. He managed uh, to win, beat uh, Boris Gelfand very quickly because Boris Gelfand famously blundered here. He played, I believe, the most natural move in the position, bishop to d3, which both defends the pawn on e4 and gets ready to castle, just to get surprised by this little tactical nuance, knight takes d5, pawn takes d5, bishop takes c3, b takes c3, queen takes c3, after which black is winning material, since it's not possible to defend everything, and Gelfand find nothing better than to play queen d2, sacrifice his rook in the corner. But really he didn't have enough compensation and he actually went on uh, to lose a fairly painful game. So bishop d3, it's a, it's a very nice kind of uh, thing to know that our opponent's most natural move in the position is a losing move, so he must play some slightly less intuitive moves. Already a lot of potential to make a mistake. As b e5 in this position I believe is even worse than a move ago, because here the knight is not even forced to go back, he can go forward very much. Knight e4, knight g4 are both very good with a lot of pressure against white center, which is bound to collapse very quickly. That would be a bad move. White essentially had two logical moves, bishop d2 and knight d2. Both of them are fairly similar. Knight d2 is a move mostly preferred by grandmasters. I think the typical club player is not going to be facing this type of move fairly qu frequently because it's basically moving the same piece twice. But if you think about it, it's a very logical move. Defending this pawn, also unpinning the knight. So at this point, uh, black already can take the pawn on a6. And you see it's very nice to take it right now because if now uh, white takes on a6, this is a very good chance for us to recapture actually with the queen harassing white's position, not allowing him very easily to castle, uh, which, which is actually a very good news for black. So usually black needs to play a move, a white needs to play a move such as bishop e2. And here uh, black can do almost anything. He can just play d6 followed by knight d7, which is the easiest solution. And my recommendation is to take immediately on the e2 and, and still play queen a6. Because one rule of thumb in the Benko gambit is that Exchanging queens usually is a good thing because in the end game black's pressure on the queen side uh, will be very annoying to deal with. Also the queen 
is defending some key squares in his position. So for example, if white exchanges, black should be very happy to exchange with the knight. Once again, with the idea to penetrate one of these juicy light squares inside white's camp, which are no longer defended by the queen. So that's about the move knight to d2. And the most frequently I played move in this position and the one you, you would probably see the most is the move bishop to d2. I want you to pay attention to the fact that the potential discovered attacks against the black queen are essentially not dangerous at all, so we can ignore that altogether and continue bishop takes a6. This position I think is already very comfortable for black. White has some small difficulties developing his pieces. For example, if bishop takes a6, once again black is recapturing with the queen. The only way for white to castle in this game would be to play the move queen to e2. After which white black can play this thematic move in the accelerated banco, the move e6 instead of d6, trying to use his development advantage. And after queen takes a6, knight takes a6, d takes e6, f takes e6. This position was featured in some grandmaster games once again. Objectively the position is around even, but black won really a lot of games because his position is immensely active here. He can go d5, it can go knight b4, knight d3, knight c2, all of those thematic ideas. All of his pieces are extremely active, the bishop, those two rooks are nicely positioned on the open files. This is a very nice outcome uh, for black in the opening. So uh, this wraps up uh, this uh, kind of short introduction to the accelerated uh, Banco. For more information, I would recommend you uh, watching some games in the, in the database in this line. Uh, especially big experts in this variation are some um, uh, Croatian and Serbian uh, grandmasters. Um, so a lot of games by grandmasters such as Ivanisevic and uh, Perunovic. Uh, take a look at this for more info. Hope to enjoy this one. Hope you will have uh, good results and good success in this opening line. And thank you for watching. Take care. Bye bye.